All right, uh, welcome to week 11 in this new and strange time for our class. Uh, this is just to get us all on the same page in terms of the homework. Um, so I spent a couple weeks here on getting that lay in to read again, just in terms of review and then lighting the figure last week. So I think we only need one week to spend on the head and that's why we're here and we didn't do quite as much or any of it last time. Uh, so we're going to talk about this today just in terms of what it is that you're expected to do for your homework which is going to be due at the end of April. So the upcoming assignments that will be due is uh, the 22nd, so still a few weeks away, and then you have another one uh, homework due right after that, the end of April. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of time at the beginning of April to get settled in uh, your new working conditions from home and um, you'll slowly get some time now to develop both of these assignments. Next week we'll be starting to look at drapery and then from there hands feet and then we're pretty much kind of coming up on the end of the class. So again this is just to point your attention to you know, what's coming up, what, what's due, what homeworks do when. So today we're going to focus on um, heads. Some of these are laid in already, or a couple, just so that it will be a little bit faster in terms of uh, me showing you how the, the process for lighting them will go. And we'll start with this one at the bottom for those of you that might want to review. So I'll do a quick kind of head construction and then light this to show you the whole process. I also wrote the process up here. I got a little... Let's, uh, somehow got written over, but I'll get rid of that. Um, you can see here that I've really pulled primarily from the film, film stills. That's a really easy and good place to get reference for your, your heads if you're interested. Um, here's a website that I'll, I'll use. It's just called filmgrab.com. It's free. You don't have to, to pay for it. And it's, uh, I believe it's made by an artist that, or a, a film, a person in film, it just collects like what the most pivotal or the most um, uh, kind of dynamic scenes from films are uh, that they enjoy. So like this is Pet Cemetery, you know, and you could study these different scenes for you know how storytelling works and how uh, maybe tension is built up or w whatever. But movies always have a great um, isolation of faces and and really clear lighting on faces. So it's really easy to find, you know, a, a nice uh, large image of a face that has all kinds of different lighting. And that's so you don't have to always study like the three quarter lighting. Um, and you can try different ages. You don't always have to be doing the same, um, you know, like I think the Bodies in Motion site has kind of all like within the same age range. Uh, there's hundreds of films here. So maybe you'll find one you like, or maybe you just want to search around uh, and pick out something that you're you know, not familiar with just for the experience of checking it out. So that would be a great place, I would say, to check your homework and see if um, there's anything here that you'd be kind of interested or excited to study. So I chose for, you know, these, the, this is a movie called Seven. This is The Village with, uh, or made by M. Night. And then this is The Godfather. So there's, uh, I guess, kind of all in the same, like similar genres, it's kind of scary or, or drum, dramatic movies. Uh, that's a case where you can expect to find some of this more deeper lighting. Okay, so the good news here is that you don't have to learn anything new about lighting per se, right? That the stuff that we learned with um, the figure in terms of the last few weeks, like um, edges, right? That there's four edges now that you know where you know all this well. That each one of those edges applies to a different experience of form. So there's a sphere which equals soft edges, there's a cylinder which equals firm edges, there's a box and that always gives you hard edges, and then the very last one would be uh, atmosphere, so kind of like light dissipating and that would be what's called lost edges. Right, so those are your four. These are always the transition point between light and shadow. So in drawing we don't really need to draw anything with light 
because it's a white paper. So all you're doing is creating the timing as that light turns into the shadow and then filling the shadow with a value. And we've been doing that now for, for weeks. So in addition to this, you just need to know that there's a form shadow, which is just the shadow going across the ball. And then there's a cast shadow. And that these two things are almost always seen together. Whenever there is a form shadow, there's a cast shadow. I will be working from, or like in the figure where we've been working from in terms of the experience of light, is you're always looking to identify the core shadow. And that's just this darkest area on the object. It's also kind of a synonym for form shadow. Sometimes these two can be the same. So we're starting from our core shadow. You're looking to identify what kind of volume it is, and that tells you the edge you're going to assign. And then once you find that, you're going to be looking to see if there's a cast shadow that follows it. In terms of the head, when we taught it, or I taught it the first time, we didn't use anything but spheres, boxes, and cylinders. So here, like in the lay-in, those should all be really clear. The only thing that we're going to add that is uh, really not that new because we talked about it last week is creating a thumbnail. Right. So um, here I just gave you the first three steps that would be all you have to consider for your homework. So you develop a thumbnail. This would be something in addition to or separate from the actual drawing of the head rendering. You lay in the head, which means the construction. So I do want you to be able to construct them. This is going to be a good review of how we drew heads prior. And also it's a necessary step to get the value to read correctly. And then the very last step is you're just blocking in your value, which means you're doing the exact same things you did with the figure. You're looking for that core shadow. You're developing the edge. And then if there is a cast shadow, you'd add that. Um, this you don't have to worry about because I would be kind of developing this further in terms of bringing the rendering out even more. And I don't think that's, I mean, that'd be maybe be a later class. Okay, so if we take these in order, what's the first most important thing? If we're going to do this drawing for homework, I would want you to do, and this could be really small, that's why it's called a thumbnail, a uh, frame. Right, so we did this with the figures last week, as I mentioned. Uh, and this is so that we can get a sense for how storytelling works in an image. And that's why film is such a great uh, reference point here, because it is always telling a story. It's not just a floating head being rendered. If you want, you can start out with the divisions of the frame, just to help guide where you're seeing some of these shapes. And first thing I'll do is just get the basic lay in. And these don't have to be nice looking drawings, but when I see um, Bryce Howard, she's in the middle, and that tells me a lot about this sequence. Right, so it's a strong image of her. It's symmetrical, and that always contributes a feeling of strength. Okay, so that's something I get. There's symmetry, is what I've learned so far. The second thing I want to do is figure out how the value scale is being used. So remember we have 1 to 10, and I always think of 10 as the darkest. So five in the middle. Most film stills, or just movies in general, don't go past five different compositions that use value. And they very rarely exceed three values in the image itself. And that's what I'm looking to try to get here. So if I just kind of rough out, and you know, I might consider if you're doing this with a pencil, do it with a large marker so that you can't come in and make detail. Uh, and so I'll just draw out really quickly where I think the big light and dark shapes are. So I'm not even doing a lay-in for this because it doesn't matter. I'm just doing my basic shapes and then I'll squint when I'm doing this and try to get a graphic read. Remember that's the most important thing for enticing a viewer and bringing them into the image is just if there's an interesting uh, two-dimensional read of lights and darks. And so if you're a graphic design major then that might be something that interests you to really spend some time thinking about. And so here's a mouth. And 
it's kind of a moody image and that's because there isn't a lot of mid value it's predominantly light and dark then her neck and then shirt okay so then that's it right I don't have to do more than that most of this image is a value 10 and if you want a, a rule for how to try to observe these most again film unless it's horror movies tend to have a 60 30 10 division which means um, one of these three would be the majority one would be kind of in between and then one would be the minority and it doesn't matter which is which it could be dark middle light it could be light middle dark or you could infinitely switch it up the reason that people will use this is because your eye always tracks the minority in an image so almost always your eye will try to find this or that's where it's going to settle so if I look at this picture there is a lot of dark and I just use a big brush or a marker and I look for how all the shapes are welding if there's like a that kind of jumps over and only the hair is really left to kind of be that lighter rim light on the side and there's a dark shape here and like a little shape for the mouth Again, so it doesn't have to be a nicely made drawing here you're just looking to see uh, how it, the image is planned out it's kind of like the gesture in terms of the figure drawing where I want to get the big structure of how value is used so that when I go on to create the more specific rendering to form that I have this to the side that I can reference and come back to and don't lose sight of it so this is I think uh, by far 60 percent so this is primarily a dark image and then in terms of the middle value is there a middle value yeah I think it's probably like um, maybe here so it's like the side of the face so her forehead's kind of a value five in some areas the hair is part of the background maybe just like right there and her shirt is closer uh, maybe even like part of the nose and then I'd say the smallest area of the image is the light and that would either be of the window and that's like a, a pretty dramatic part to the picture because it's surrounded by so much dark and then also like the side of the face there and that would be it so these are the things I'm looking to find again there's not like a right or wrong answer you're just trying to learn about how different value compositions are put together um, we don't always have great ideas so looking at other people's work is a great way to build out your uh, Kind of mental library of stuff that you could pull from and develop later okay so step one is done you would do that for each of the the heads that you're developing for homework and now I'm going to do a um, review of the construction and if you're good with your construction you can probably just fast forward this part to me lighting the head but in case you you do need it uh, here is our steps so first thing I would do in laying this down is to get the sphere. This is a centered image. Uh, and if you're doing these for homework, you would repeat that where you make the frame again. For uh, the size of these, let's say you're doing your 8.5 by 11 sheets for the homework, I think you could do two per page. So if we split these in the middle, like that 8.5 by 11 page, and then do a tiny thumbnail at the top, and then you could do a larger you know maybe half the size of the page for the development of the um, actual drawing or like kind of the more refined drawing that you'll end up doing for homework so that's a kind of basic the, how small or large they could be uh, if that's too cramped you could also turn it horizontal and do like one per side just don't make these super tiny and make sure that each time you do do one they exist with a frame and, and that might at times work to your advantage because parts of the heads are cropped or you don't always have to draw the entire uh, thing and that's fine too we talked a lot about how crops work last week so if you do find um, in terms of 
homework examples to draw from some heads that are cropped, that's fine. So let's, this is just to give you that idea, uh, small, maybe thumbnail could be like that big, and then you could do your image like this. Okay, so we have our, our head, I have the jaw. You don't even have to worry too much about likeness, although I'll try to get somewhere near. But the goal really is to just give me enough that I can start to light, and then I'll bring out more of the specific shapes with the, the light and shadow shapes. There's a neck. Shoulder line. Brow line is half of the ball. And then proportions are between brow and chin, half is the nose, half is the eye, I'm sorry, the socket, half is the eye and the keystone, and then between the nose and the chin, it's thirds. And if this is too quick and you want more of a preview, go back to the, the following module for the head. And there's much longer videos there on how all of this is put together. To get the side plane, I'm looking for the hairline, the temple, base of the nose, and then that gives you where the cutout would be. We can also add the hair, or we will also add the hair shape to this, so that's going to make the, like how precise the cutout needs to be of the side, not that important. You just want a basic idea. And then, I think now because this is going to be more of her likeness, I'll start to think about how do I match these lines to create her jaw, what does her chin look like, I don't want it to be too broad because it's going to look very male. So the things you can start to play with now if you feel like you're getting more comfortable with this. Um, you don't have to draw the ear because it's not there, but I want to know where it would start so I can get that cheek, so that's the cheek on either side. Then from here let's add the keystone. eye socket, and again I'm aiming for something that looks robotic. But every time I'm putting a corner, so in any time you construct, like whether it's a figure or in this case the head, every time you now assign or create a corner, all that you're going to be doing later is just turning that into an edge. And that's this going back to that equation that we've discussed where anytime you have a form change or a plane change, we see it as a value difference. So all of these lines represent plane changes. So all you have to do when you come back over this is substitute the line for an edge. Here's the nose, just kind of slightly under. So here's the underplane of the nose, connect it back up. <coughs> See how this line for the plane change of the nose is just an edge. So I would choose what, what one of the four is it. The corner of the eye lines up with the wing of the nose or the outside of the nose. So that tells me that that's where I should start the, the shape. Could double check because the center of the eye lines up with the corner of the mouth. So that just gives me a, a landmark there to help place both. And then I'm going to put this big volume just as a reminder that the mouth is round. And then a shape for the chin. And that's good enough. You don't have to do more than this. Uh, I'm going to put a, like a, think of the hair as a hat. So I'm going to just put some, a shape, one outline that just goes around. So every time it hits a, a corner or a, a line, it, it will change to fit around the surface. So think of it like a big hat. Don't draw the strands of hair, like all the different, uh, like drawing every single strand of hair would be horrible.
doesn't have to be perfect, just get a basic idea. The reason this might be um, or will be important is because the hair is casting a shadow on the face too. <coughs> That's good enough. So this is something I could always adjust or fix later, but I don't need it to be perfect. So next, let's turn that down just so it doesn't end up competing. And <clears throat> super important, when you're developing these, you have to hold the brush from the side. And so I'm going to take my brush in Photoshop and change it to match that. I'm going to make it soft and then I'm going to squash the brush so that it has the same angle to it that my pencil would have if I were you know, holding it from my fingers on parallel to the page. So that's that. Let's have it dark. And now it doesn't matter where you start, but you could begin mapping from anywhere. So like in here, let's just start from right to left. Um, light's coming from the side and just slightly in front of the face. So I'm going to begin here, and I'm looking for the darkest part. If it helps you to squint, you can. But this would be a, like a, as soft an edge as you can make it without it being completely diffuse because it's not a lost edge. A lost edge wouldn't be describing form. So I'm putting it here. I'm just separating this as a shape into light and shadow. So hair kind of comes down. It's basically a ball. So that's my fuzzy core shadow to show something that's really soft. And then that shape is here too, so that's the, the hair kind of pulling across the forehead, and I'm rounding it so that it moves with that surface. And then as soon as it gets here, now I start to see how it's casting a shadow. So that's going to be really sharp. And I always exaggerate this so that the contrast between these two is really um, overstated. This is all a cast shadow too, from the shape of the hair kind of rolling across the cheek. So whenever you're doing this, you just have to remember all of your shadow shapes have to wrap around these underlying surfaces. So you're just tracing them, like an ant that's walking across. This is still a cast shadow. Here it gets a little bit sharper. And then I'm also seeing that my jaw's too wide, right? So I can bring this in, which is what I meant earlier when I say I'll correct for shapes. And that's Unless you really are very careful with your underdrawing, then you might not have to. Just because I'm down here, I see that the hair also casts a shadow around the neck. And then the shape of the collar casts a shadow on the neck too. It goes like that, down. So opening. So there's a bit of, then this becomes a form shadow, because that's when the cast shadow of the hair starts to dissipate. And then we have some form shadow around the bottom of the jaw. Here's a, a form shadow over the muscle of the neck, and then it turns into a cast shadow here. So you're really just studying shape. Now for those of you that feel like you have more of an aptitude for observational drawing, this is right up your alley. I'm really just trying to match what I see as closely as possible. Now let's start to work our way across. So I have the eyebrow. I'm seeing that as a darker shape and that's a, a really soft form that also goes right on top of my construction line for the brow. We have this little light area where light hits on the up, upper corner or outside corner of the eye and then the brow and the I will say the brow is casting a shadow into the pocket here. So that's a darker, sharper edge. Comes down. And then to start, I always light the eye just as a large ball. So I'm just going to do this. And I think that that makes 
your life so much easier. People always want to draw the pupil first and then they have to make all this rendering look natural around it. So start with the biggest form and then work your way into smaller and smaller forms. So some of the form shadow coming from the hair. Here's the bottom of the, the eye. Now the nose. So core shadow, this is more boxy because that's a bone. So I'm not going to put edge there. The center of the nose here is more of a cylinder so that can get a, a bit of a softer edge. But you could see there's a difference between this area, this area, and then the bottom of the nose is rounded so that's going to get softer edges. It's just like a little ball here. So I'll just get that to be as feathered as possible. That's my goal. Then the nose kind of follows down that stem, which was the center of our construction. And then on this side, we have something of a, a form shadow on the nostril. Probably nostril is most like a box or cylinder, so it's not a lot of edge. And then you get a little cast shadow for the underneath the nose. Then on the other side, you have the nose as a whole casting a shadow into the socket. So here, out over the cheek. So now I'm using all mostly sharp edges. Then it starts to get further from the light source here, so a little bit more blurry, but it's still a cast shadow. And then this is the nose casting a shadow over the shape of the mouth and then coming back to the shape there. And then just like for the eye, do the same thing for the mouth. Find where the sphere of that mouth is being lit and then try to present it or render it as a ball. So it's kind of getting light from this area. Otherwise, I think it's really easy to have uh, move too quickly to the lips and the lips can often look like they're not in the, the same perspective as the rest of the face. There's just some half tone here to integrate the cheek. So that cheek is turning in from that side. I'm going to bring up the jaw a little bit. And then the shape of the mouth casts a shadow over the chin, like this. And the chin itself is getting form shadow. So it has a, a soft edge, like that. Now when you have this much, it's pretty easy just to come in and design what are the shapes that you see around the mouth, where there is. Here's a philtrum, and that has a form and a cast shadow. Form here, cast shadow there and then just make a, a shape for the mouth or the lips. Here's the, when we talked about the lips, we said it looks like a cupid's bow or a door wedge, you know, however you wanted to remember it or think of it. And it doesn't have to be, again, I'm not looking for you in these drawings or even in the homework to create perfect likenesses. It doesn't matter to me at all. I just want you to get a sense for how the lighting works and to see if you can map out the lighting on the head. That's a good first step um, that says a lot. If you can do that much, the next step would then be to get more interested in the likeness, which just means choosing out areas to render or you know, cleaning up proportions or spending a little bit more time. And on this side, I'm going to do the same thing with the eye, just light part of it. If you look at, you know, old portraits, you'll always see that no one renders both eyes. They leave one blurry and then one more detailed. And that's because it's strange for us as viewers to have both eyes in high focus. It looks bizarre in paintings because we can only really focus on one. So all portrait artists make one eye a focal point. So here is now the cast shadow of that eye over the cheek and then the cheek is a really soft edge on her. And that basically it just follows our cheek plane, that line. So I'm just going over this line and turning it into an edge, which is what I've done with all of these edges. I'm going to blur this one because that's turning closer to the shadow. She has a little shape that's kind of near the corner of her mouth that's in light, and that's like the, the area of the mouth getting a little bit more pronounced, so grabbing light there. And then there's something of a cast shadow from the lip. That's it. 
and basically done. I made probably the shape of the hair too big, so let's bring that in. And then on this side, the, the hair is getting rim light from the window. So if we did, we could do the same thing we did on the other side, which is just to give it that softer framing. And now just fill it in. So you, this is, you're done at this point. So take my side of my pencil and just kind of go through and fill in the shapes with whatever value you think it is. So this is a pretty dark value, but I never want it to be darker than the core shadow. So it goes like this. I'm gonna try to blend all of these shadows in together so that they create like one welded shape. Nose. And I usually start out or try to aim just to get all the shadows the same value. And then if I can do that, I'll come back on the next pass, which you, we're not doing, you're just kind of focusing on these as lay-ins, but I'll start to divide that by adding more complexity. So what shapes are now darker or lighter? And that would be the way to kind of develop the portrait more. And shapes here for the nose, for the mouth. And then just for some context, we could put some lighter dark shapes around her. Um, and I'm doing this because you know part of what I am, I'm asking you to do for homework is to put in the the whole image so that you'd have a you'd be filling in the rest of your composition or your frame. And that's really important for value because value is relative. What's light or dark is only light or dark because what's around it. Uh, this would be cast shadow on her shoulder. And there's a lot of dark on this side. So no features in terms of irises or eyelids or eyeballs. This is all I'm asking you to do. So you don't have to spend your, your time, you know, rendering faces. I'm really just looking for you to get a strong foundation that we could later turn into something that's more rendered. For hair, that's fine too. Right? The, the only time you would see strands is just in half tone. So like an easy cheat for hair is just to put wherever that core shadow is, just to kind of design something like this for where you think the texture is. We only see areas, we only see texture this applies to everything, hair, skin, fruit, whatever, in the areas of halftone. In the lights, it's usually blown out. In the shadow, it's usually hidden. So if you can identify halftone, it was just the, the part of the form that's turning towards the light, that's where you see texture. So that would be like here too. And that's how I cheat hair. Okay, so this is um, from beginning to end, or from thumbnail to lay-in, how I'm asking you to develop these and then create homework. So that's the entirety of what you're focused on, uh, but if you would like to see a few more examples, I'll do um, one more by looking at one of the uh, drawings above.